Welcome to this Sunday's service from St. Columbus Church in Ennis, County Clare, with the churches of Kilnasula and Christchurch, Spanish Point. Today we hear the story of the baptism of Christ, the temptation in the wilderness, and the capture of John the Baptist, all in one very short passage from Mark's Gospel. We also consider whether at the beginning of Lent, we should see ourselves as criminals seeking pardon or the sick and ailing in need of healing. And so we start our service. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Your unfailing kindness, O Lord, is in the heavens and your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Lord, have mercy. Your righteousness is like the strong mountains and your justice as the great deep. Christ, have mercy. For with you is the well of life and in your light shall we see light. Lord, have mercy. Circle us, Lord. Keep comfort within and discouragement without. Keep love within and hatred out. Circle us, Lord, keep protection near and danger afar. Keep light within, keep darkness out. Surround us, Lord, keep peace within and fear without. The Eternal Father, Son and Holy Spirit, surround us on every side now and for ever. Amen. And so we pray. Heavenly Father, your Son battled in the wilderness of temptation and grew closer to you in the desert. Help us to use these days to grow in wisdom and prayer that we may witness to your saving love in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now hear the Gospel of St. Mark. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved, with you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for forty days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Here ends the reading. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I must confess to a small sinking of the heart as Lent commences. It is not so much the sombre tone and appearance of the church. I actually quite like the muted change that comes over a church in Lent. It is not the work of running a Lent course. I would very much enjoy teaching. I only wish I had the opportunity to continue a very interesting course called Living the Questions that we had to stop after only two sessions last Lent as the COVID restrictions commenced. Neither is it the discipline of giving up or the taking up of new disciplines that troubles me. That also can be a useful way of concentrating the mind and revisiting priorities, and also getting rid of some lockdown kilos. Nor is it the call to do penance that troubles me although we are getting warmer. 
What concerns me is the tendency of church teaching, especially in the liturgy and in hymns, to concentrate on human sin and error from only one perspective. The tendency of the season to view the complexity and vulnerability of the human condition through just one simplistic and, I would say, erroneous lens. Don't get me wrong, I am not leading up to a denial of human sin and its consequences. Our newspapers are far too full of accounts of woeful human behavior and its tragic consequences. There is simply too much suffering, too much cruelty, too much selfishness and greed in the world to be under any illusion about the depths to which we as a species can descend. Sin is real, pervasive, destructive of ourselves and others. But all too often, and I would argue for far too long, the Western Church has tended to see human failings in terms of crimes and punishment. Our philosophical, overly logical and quasi-judicial theology has come to see God as a kind of celestial president of the court, seated on high, stern, distant, commanding, passing sentence. We below commit sins for which we shall ultimately be judged and for which we must make atonement. The supposed consolation is that God also loves us and therefore sent his own son to receive the infinite and savage punishment that otherwise we so richly deserve and that but for Jesus' intervention God would actually meet out to us willingly, intentionally. Throughout early history, we try to buy off this angry God with animal sacrifices in our temples and shrines. Concessions were made for the poor, but really what God wanted was our most prized, our most perfect, our most expensive animals. But of course, as it was supposed that our crimes and sinfulness were infinite, it was never good enough. We would never be able to pay the infinite price that God required. And so the logic goes, only a human sacrifice would do. But since we are all so utterly corrupt and unwholesome, not one of us would do as the sacrifice of perfect and infinite value. So Jesus had to be offered instead of us, the only offering of sufficient quality to pay God's price, because it had been taught that he was perfect and utterly and completely sinless. That assumption, by the way, is why we so often struggle with Bible passages that seem to depict Jesus as impatient or occasionally partisan or angry or difficult. Because we have laid upon him the burden of being faultless, we then struggle with anything that might deviate from that claim. And also, by the same logic, it was vital to claim that Jesus was the result of a virgin birth, because otherwise he would be supposed to have inherited original sin through human procreation. Incidentally, the means by which the people we most respect, admire and love have also been brought into the world. Of course, I have oversimplified and exaggerated to make the point but so too do certain hymns. For example, there was a green hill far away in which there was no other good enough to pay the price of sin, which we can sing each Lent without questioning or thinking about what it really means. 
it's as if we are expected to worship and revere divine child abuse, the ritual torture and execution of, we are told, a much-loved son for the crimes of others to assuage the infinite anger of a God who, despite being omnipotent and omniscient, cannot conceive of any other way of reconciling the created, the mortal, the fallible with the eternal, the immortal, and the unflawed. One of the problems in church life is that we do eventually take on new ideas, but we somehow cannot let go of the old. So we end up with a confused and frankly increasingly incoherent theology where many, if not most modern Christians, accept that we came into being through the root of evolution. But all too often, we continue to pay lip service to, even teach, either overtly or implicitly, a doctrine of original sin based on the actions of the mythical first ever human beings, Adam and Eve. But let's be frank, there is no original sin in the literal sense because there were no original sinners. The story of Adam and Eve still has great value for what it teaches us about the moral choices that we face every single day. And it is likely that however much we might hopefully progress into the future, we shall also always wrestle with this inner tension between our morality and the desire to put ourselves first because of the need to feed and protect this vulnerable mortal body. It should also be said that the Genesis story of the creation, whilst it is also allegorical, does reveal a high degree of intuitive genius. The Genesis account is profoundly insightful in the degree to which it is consonant with our present understanding of the evolution of the earth and its creatures from primeval chaos into increasing levels of sophisticated development. That it progressed in stages and that humanity is a later addition. For the composers of Genesis, people without the benefit of any scientific information, it is a remarkable achievement. So we need not throw out the baby with the bathwater. But the temptation in the garden story cannot signify that we carry an inherited guilt from an actual single event in the prehistoric past. For Genesis is neither history nor anthropology. And that must also lead us to question the historical and factual nature of the story about Jesus being tempted in the wilderness by Satan. There are other strands of Christian theology that take a rather different approach. While recognizing the reality of sin, we can also see ourselves not so much as actively and determinedly evil, but as morally disabled. This need to protect ourselves that can become all-consuming, unwell, impaired, afflicted with the inability to consistently make good and wise moral choices left to our own devices. Seen in this light, we are not so much in need of punishment as of healing and restoration to spiritual health. We are in need of guiding, protection from ourselves and our worst impulses for the sake of ourselves as well as others. We need leading, teaching, and yes, constraining. 
In many ways, we need a doctor, not a judge, a healer, not an executioner. We need Jesus as the teacher, the inspirer, the doctor, the healer of the Gospels, the one who shows us the way. Perhaps as we hear the readings and hymns and liturgy of Lent, we might learn to see the season and ourselves, not, or at least not entirely, through the lens of crime and punishment, but as Jesus sees us, through the eyes of compassion and untold patience. Let us by all means be sorry that we cannot love ourselves and one another as surely Christ himself continues to love and pour out himself for us. Amen. We are pilgrims along the way of life. Therefore, let us remind ourselves of the path of faith that has brought us to this time and place. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us now pray for our church, for ourselves and neighbours and for the needs of the whole world. May we use this season of Lent as a time of dedication and renewal, a time of study and reflection, of asking ourselves the questions that we tend to sweep under the carpet. May we be honest and humble in our faith within ourselves and with those we encounter. Christ be with us, around and beside us. We pray that your church may stand courageously against that which is evil. Oppression, discrimination, injustice, violence, prejudice, bigotry, and the fear that all too often underlies all our sins and offenses. We pray for those who have become possessed by greed or selfishness, those who are indifferent to the sufferings and needs of others. Christ be with us, around and beside us. We pray for exploited peoples, for those caught up in sectarian violence and war, for those who have been driven from their homes and lands, and for those denied justice and the rule of impartial law. We pray for those who suffer racial, religious, or gender prejudice, those forced to lead diminished lives. Christ be with us, around and beside us. We give thanks for healers and reconcilers of people, for those who dedicate their lives to alleviate the suffering of others for medical staff, caregivers, charity workers, peace and community workers, for those who bring light into the darkest of places and those who bring calm and safety where there was danger and harm. We give you thanks for all who have shown us your truth and your love, those whom we have loved but see no more. May they now reside in your nearer presence, held in your close embrace. Christ be with us, around and beside us. 
Together we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. Power and, and the glory. glory. Forever and ever. Amen. The love of the faithful creator, the peace of the wounded healer, the joy of the challenging spirit, the hope of the three in one, surround and encourage and bless you and all those whom you love today, tomorrow and forever. Amen. Let us go in the peace of Christ. Thanks be to God.